So, um, Adam was born in Vav, Ukraine, but was forced to leave as an infant when the Red Army occupied the city. After studying philosophy at Yegelonian University in Krakow, he moved to Paris, where he would remain until 2002. His, one, he is one of Polish, Poland's most famous contemporary poets. In 2010, he was nominated for the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Literature. Zagievsky is considered one of Generation 68, or new wave writers in Poland. His early work it was protest poetry, though he moved away from that emphasis in his later work. The reviewer Joachim T. Bayer noted that world, in world literature today, that Zagievsky's themes are the night dreams, history and time, and infinity and eternity, and silence and death. Poet and reviewer Robert Pinsky commented that his poems are about the present and past of ordinary life. History not chronicle of the dead or animal to be illuminated by some doctrine, but as an immense, sometimes subtle force inhering in what people see and feel every day, and in the ways we see and feel. Since 1988, he has served as visiting associate professor of English and in the creative writing program at the University of Houston. He is currently the co-editor of a literary review that is published in Paris. He has been given many awards, including a fellowship in the Berliner Kunstler Program, the Kurt Tolchowski Prize, a Prix de Liberté, a Neustadt International Prize for Literature, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. In 2013, Zagievsky was awarded the Zongen International Prize for Poetry, considered China's Nobel Poetry Prize. He is also receiving a Gangzhou for a Lifetime Achievement Award, which has been bestowed on him by the Keeling Hao Group, an informal association that brings together influential poets born in the 1970s. As a student of literature, what I find most interesting about his poetry is his ability to create poetry that is accessible to anyone, no matter the content. Please help me in welcoming Adam Zagievsky. Good afternoon. Do you hear me okay? It's so nice to be in this pottery studio. After all, we are made from clay too. Right? <laughs> and so we just have to apply a little fire to us <laughs> and we'll be stronger. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. I don't need to tell you I'm here for the first time. And I'm very much impressed by this community. You, you've created a kind of uh, what the Italians called Città Ideale, you, 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 this perfect city, right? You have everything. Uh, so, okay. So I will I will read some poems. If if anyone would like to ask me a question between two, not maybe between two lines, but, <laughs> <laughs> but between two poems, you're welcome. And then, then we'll have a, a Q&A. I can answer questions if, if you have. Um, OK, I, I always remember I'm coming from a kind of, how should I put it? Uh, I'm I'm not young. It, you, you may you may be um, you know amazed, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm the younger poet in the kind of constellation of Polish poets. It was a kind of a miracle in Polish poetry around mid 20th century. Suddenly, great talents appeared. Czesław Milos, who later be be got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and Zbigniew Herbert never got the Nobel Prize, but it's not that important, you know, the poetry is important <laughs> and not the prizes. Uh, and Wisława Szymborska, and a little bit less known Tadeusz Różewicz. Some poetry readers know his work as well. Uh, so when I was very young, I knew this, I read this. Poets, uh, Miłosz came last because he was on the forbidden list. You know, he was a polit political emigre, 
and the communist government didn't allow for any presence of his books in Poland. Uh, so he was known only by a small group of people who had access to emigre magazines and, and books. Uh, and I, I remember I was maybe, I don't know, 23, 24. I was already writing, already publishing. I already published maybe two poems. In, and, and then we had one of these night walks with fellow poets. And one of them, so, and young poets always discuss, who is the greatest living poet? Right? <laughs> and one of them said, yeah, of course, Czesław Miłosz. And I didn't know who Czesław Miłosz was. I felt so ashamed, you know, so he's this, this greatest poet, and I don't, I don't know him. So I started, I, it was not easy to find his books, but I did. And so since he became one of my favorite poets, of course. Uh, okay, so we, we can, if you wish, we can return to this in your, with the help of your questions. I'll start with several new poems which haven't been yet published in English. This is a, a, a little, I, I mean, this is a, do you know who, who Werner Heisenberg was, right? The famous physicist. Uh, one of the geniuses of physics in the 20th century. He, he got the Nobel, we always had this Nobel Prize. <laughs> he got the Nobel Prize when he was 32 or something, so pretty young. Right? And later he stayed in Germany during the war. There's this play, Copenhagen, about, by Michael Frayn, about his conversations with Niels Bohr and how Heisenberg tries to enlist Bohr for the, you know, for the work for the uh, Nazi atom, atomic bomb. Mm. Uh, so the poem, I, I, I learned by chance that he came to Krakow. Uh, I have to tell you who Hans Frank, do you know who Hans Frank was? He was one of the Nazi criminals. He was the governor of Poland under Hitler for five years, and he, he, he was a terrible guy. Okay, enough, and now I can read the poem. <laughs> uh, 1943, Werner Heisenberg pays a visit to Hans Frank in Krakow. It was a difficult visit, though elementary particles never commented on current events. Hans Frank, a refined connoisseur of art, a murderer, was his older brother's classmate. What they shared was love for music. You don't choose your brother and his friends. He didn't quite know why Frank chose the royal castle for his residence in Krakow. The passerby seemed to him so sad. They moved like black puppets. Clouds were gloomy and silent. The city like a frosted mirror. It was December, a frosted month. Elementary particles never said a word. He gave a lecture for Germans only. He couldn't understand these clouds, this mirror. Luckily, other things absorbed him soon. His homeland was on fire. This was not his homeland. Dark streets, leafless trees, chill in the air, women muffled in shawls and scarves. It must have been a dream. In his autobiography, he, he left out this episode meaningless after all. What's inarticulate should remain so. So he thought. He actually wrote a very beautiful autobiography, The Whole and the Part, uh, where he's very discreet about unpleasant things. <laughs> uh. Now, I, I, I've written 
uh, recently a whole series of poems uh, on my mother who died oh, a long time, a long time ago. But I needed time for this. So this one is called Public Speaking Contest. Uh, my mother was uh, a law student before the war. She's in Lvov or Lviv in this now Ukrainian city. Public Speaking Contest. Or when she told us, for the tenth time maybe, about the speaking, about the public speaking contest that as a young law student, she had won, nearly won, even though she faced serious competition. And like everyone was stunned that a woman had won, nearly won, and not a man, a future judge or lawyer, she came out the best, nearly the best, Although, technically speaking, someone else took home first prize. And that was her greatest success. And we, when we listened to her story later, much later, ironically, a little bored, thinking, you are still caught up in a competition, invisible this time, like most such occupations. And you want us to bestow the laurels they refused to use then. And how I wish I could hear her tell the story again about the contest she nearly won and in which I think after decades of her memories unceasing labor she finally carried the day. Um, now this is a different uh, there's still these, as you see these are these more recent uh, the translation is by Claire Kavanagh, my beloved translator this one is called My Favorite Poets My Favorite Poets Never Met they lived in different countries and different ages, surrounded by ordinariness, by good people and bad. They lived modestly, like an apple in an orchard. They loved clouds. They lifted their heads. A great armada of light and shade sailed above them. A film was playing that still hasn't ended. Moments of bitterness passed swiftly, likewise moments of joy. Sometimes they knew what the world was and wrote hard words on soft paper. Sometimes they knew nothing and were like children on a school playground when the first drop of warm rain the sands. Uh, I would read this one in Polar so that you understand the difficulty of my language. Moi ulubieni poeci, moi ulubieni poeci nigdy się nie spotkali. Żyli w różnych krajach i w różnych epokach otoczeni przez pospolitość, przez dobrych i złych ludzi, żyli skromnie jak jabłko w sadzie. Kochali obłoki, zadzierali głowy, płynęła nad nimi wielka armada światła i cienia. Wyświetlał się film, który się nie kończy. Chwile goryczy szybko mijały, chwile szczęścia także. Niekiedy wiedzieli, czym jest świat i pisali twarde słowa na miękkim papierze. Niekiedy nic nie wiedzieli i byli jak dzieci na szkolnym boisku, gdy spada pierwsza kropla ciepłego deszczu. <coughs> uh, 
And now this is a poem I wrote in English, which irritated my translator. <laughs> <laughs> But she forgave me. <laughs> but she knows I won't do it all the time. So. Uh, this is actually a commission for an art center in, at the University of Chicago. And the title is We Know What Art Is. We know what art is. We know so well, so well the sensation of happiness which is sometimes bittersweet, sometimes just sweet, like Turkish pastry. We appreciate art because we want to know what does it mean to be alive. We are alive, it seems, but we are not sure what does it amount to. So we go places or just open a book at home. We remember a moment of epiphany in front of a painting, the color of the sky the day it happened. We tremble when a cellist plays Bach suites and when a piano sings. We know the taste of a great poem written 2,000 years ago or yesterday. We don't understand why sometimes in a gallery we see and feel nothing nothing at all. We don't know why some books exhale the odor of forgiveness and other keep their anger for centuries. We know and then we forget. We are not sure why some artworks are shut down like Italian museum on a day of Chopin strike. Why our souls sometimes shut down like Italian museum on the day of Chopin strike? Why is art silent when terrible things come about and we don't need it even then because terrible things seem to fill the world completely, entirely? We don't know what art is. <coughs> Uh, one, <coughs> this is one more poem on this. This is one is on music on Chacon, on the Bach Chacon. The title is Chacon, but this is translated by Claire. So that's okay. <coughs> we know, everyone knows, that he spoke with the Lord in countless cantatas and in his passions. But what about the Chacon from the second partita for violin solo? Here, perhaps only here, Bach reveals his life. Suddenly, unexpectedly, tells us about himself. Quickly, violently, ejects his sadness and joy. Since that's all we've got. His despair after his wife's and children's death, his sorrow that time takes everything away from us. But he also recounts the bliss of these endless hours when in the stale air of the dark church, lonely like a pilot of a postal plane that brings mail to foreign countries, he played the organ and felt under his fingers its pneumatic playability, its happiness. Or when he heard the monolithic strong voice of the choir as if all strifes between people had come to an end. And we, we also dream of this. We also try to tell the truth of our own life and try it awkwardly ever again and will never stop trying. But where are, where could be our cantatas? Where is the other side? Tell me. Thank you.
<laughs> you like Bach. <laughs> uh, so this, this is not a, a poem which doesn't need any explanation. It's called Z Day. Z Day, when word comes that someone close has died, a friend, or someone we didn't know but admired from afar. The first moment, the first hours, he or she is gone. It's, it seems certain, predestined, maybe even irrefutable. We trust reluctantly whoever tells us, heartbroken over the phone, or maybe some announcer on the indifferent radio. But still, we can't believe it. Nothing on earth can convince us, since he still hasn't died for us. Not at all. He, she, no longer is. But still hasn't vanished for good. Quite the contrary. He is, it seems, at the strongest point of his existence. He grows, though he's no more. He still speaks, though he's gone mute. He still prevails, though he lost the battle. With what? Time, the body? But no, it's not true. He has won. He has reached completion, absolute completion. He's so complete, so great, so splendid, that he doesn't fit in life. He shatters life's frail vessel. He towers above the living as if made of another substance, the strongest bronze. But at the same time, we begin to suspect, we are afraid, we guess, we know that silence draws near and helpless grief. <clears throat> uh, now, the next poem is uh, sort of settled or set, set in Hyde Park in Chicago. You know Hyde Park is where the University of Chicago is. It's a very strange place. Uh, um, uh, it's like the opposite of urban life, you know. It's, you know the University of Chicago has killed all the restaurants around because um, they, they decided that students should learn and not go to restaurants. So, <laughs> so therefore there's the saying, you know the saying, that the University of Chicago is this place where fun comes to die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 There are even t-shirts with, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, I tell you. It's <laughs> okay, um, so the poem is called Nowhere. It was a day nowhere after I came back from my father's funeral, a day between two continents. I was lost, and I walked in the streets of Hyde Park, listening to scraps of American voices. I didn't belong anywhere. I was free. But if this was freedom, I thought, I would probably prefer to be a good king's, a decent emperor's prisoner. Leaves were floating against the stream of the Red Fall. Wind was yawning like a foxhound. A cashier in a grocery store, nowhere, asked me, where are you from? But I forgot. I wanted to tell her about my father's death, but I thought I might be a bit too old for an orphan. I was in Hyde Park, nowhere, where fun comes to die as students of other colleges claimed, not without envy. It was a Monday, a day with no character, a coward, formless, a day without inspiration, nowhere, 
even grief was not at its most radical. It seemed to me that Chopin himself on a day like this would decide at the most to give lessons to his wealthy aristocratic disciples. Suddenly I remembered what Gottfried Benn, a Berlin dermatologist, wrote about him in one of my favorite poems. When Delacroix expounded his theories, it made him nervous. He, for his part, could offer no explanation of the nocturnes. These lines, ironic and tender, at the same time, always provided me with a moment of happiness, almost as great as Chopin's music itself. This one I knew. Also, night didn't need an explanation, nor pain, nowhere. So you know about Gottfried Benn? He was, he's not so famous. He, not like Rilke, but he was a little younger than Rilke, born in 1886. A great poet. Um, he's considered the, the maybe the most important modernist in, in German poetry. Mm. Well, okay, I'll, I'll go back to some older poems. <coughs> um, this one, so, you know, when I open the book, I see, when you, when you open your book, you see your old poems, you usually know where did you write this one. So this one was written in Houston, I remember. Houston was good for writing poems. Because what can you do else? <laughs> <laughs> Lava. And what if Heraclitus and Parmenides are both right? and two worlds exist side by side, one serene, the other insane. One arrow thoughtlessly hurtles, another indulgent looks on. The self-same wave moves and stands still. Animals all at once come into the world and leave it. Birch leaves dance in the wind as they fall apart in the cruel, rusty flame. Lava kills and preserves. The heart beats and is beaten. There was a war, then there wasn't. Jews died, Jews stay alive. Cities are raised, cities endure. Love fades, the kiss everlasting. The wings of the hawk must be brown. You're still with me, though you're, we are no more. Ships sink, sand sinks, clouds wander like wedding veils in tatters. All is lost, so much brilliance. The hills gently descend with their long banners of woods. Moss inches up the stone tower of a church, its small mouth timidly praising the north. At dusk, the savage lamp of the jasmine is glowing, possessed by its own luminescence. Before a dark canvas in a museum, eyes narrow like a cat's. Everything is finished. Riders gallop black horses. A tyrant composes a sentence of death with grammatical errors. Youth dissolves in a day. Girls' faces freeze into medallions. Despair turns to rapture and the hard fruits of stars in the sky ripen 
like grapes, and beauty endures, shaken, unperturbed, and God is and God dies. Night returns to us in the evening, and the dawn is hoary with dew. This is another Houston poem. I remember people, my friends used to ask me, when you're in Houston, are you nostalgic for Krakow? And I lived then in Paris. I said, no, no, then I was nostalgic for Paris. I was nostalgic for Krakow in Paris, but <laughs> it was a kind of gradation. Um, <coughs> So this poem is called Electric Allergy. And um, because, uh, as you heard in the introduction, I was born in this city that's now in Ukraine. We were then, then almost the entire Polish population was expelled. And, and we, I spent my childhood in Silesia. Do you know what Silesia is? It's an industrial region, which uh, before the war was partly German, partly Polish, but uh, after the Second War became Polish. Uh -huh. So when we arrived, and we couldn't, I mean, I was just four months old, so I didn't make any decisions then. You know. um, but my parents brought something, but very little. There was, they were not allowed to, and by the way, they, they were pretty poor after the occupation, etc. <coughs> Anyway, so there is a, this is actually an allergy for a German radio, and it's German because we got, we found some German objects in this city which was abandoned because the Germans were expelled. This was a tragedy of the afterwar tragedy that the Poles were expelled and pushed westward, and the Germans were expelled and also pushed. Everyone went west. Like in the great migrations of early Middle Ages, uh, the, the, just the same thing. You know. <clears throat> Electric allergy. Farewell, German radio, with your green eye and your bulky box, together almost composing a body and soul. Your lamps glowed with a pink salmony light like Bergson's deep self. Through the thick fabric of the speaker, my ear glued to you as to the lattice of a confessional. Mussolini once whispered, Hitler shouted, Stalin calmly explained, Bierut hissed, Gonulka held endlessly force. These were Polish communist leaders. <coughs> But no one radio will accuse you of treason. No, your only sin was obedience, absolute tender faithfulness to the kilohertz. Whoever came was welcomed. Whoever was sent was received. Of course I know only the songs of Schubert brought you the jade of true joy. To Chopin's waltzes, your electric heart throbbed delicately and firmly, and the clothes over the speaker pulsated like the breasts of amorous girls in old novels. Not with the news, though, especially not Radio Free Europe or the BBC. Then your eye would grow nervous, the green pupil widen and shrink, as though its atropine dose had been altered. Mad seagulls lived inside you and Macbeth. At night, forlorn signals found shelter in your rooms. Sailors cried out for help. The young comet, the young comet cried, losing her head. Your old age was announced by a cracked voice, then rattles, coughing, and finally blindness. Your eye faded and total silence. Sleep peacefully, German radio, 
dream Schumann and don't waken when the next dictator rooster crows. <coughs> Uh, maybe now there's this poem. It's a, it's a bit longer, but you know, America is a great continent, so. I can <laughs> 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 uh, three angels. <clears throat> Suddenly, three angels appeared right here by the bakery on St. George Street. No, not another Census Bureau survey, one tired man sighed. No, the first angel said passionately. We just wanted to see what your lives have become, the flavor of your days, and why your nights are marked by restlessness and fear. That's right, fear. A lovely, dreamy-eyed woman replied, but I know why. The labors of the human mind have faltered. They seek help and support they can't find. Sir, just take a look. She called the angel Sir. At Wittgenstein, our sages and leaders are melancholy madmen and know even less than us ordinary people. But she wasn't ordinary. Then, too, said one boy who was learning to play the violin, evenings are just an empty carton, a casket minus mysteries, while at dawn the cosmos seems as parched and foreign as a TV screen. And besides, those who love music for itself are few and far between. Others spoke up and their laments surged into a swelling sonata of wrath. If you gentlemen want to know the truth, one tall student yelled. He had just lost his mother. We've had enough of death and cruelty, persecution, disease, and long spells of boredom still as a serpent's eye. We've got too little fire and too much earth. We don't know who we are. But still, the second angel mumbled shyly, there's always a little joy, and even beauty lies close at hand, beneath the bark of every hour in the quiet heart of concentration, and another person hides in each of us, universal, strong, invincible. White roses sometimes hold the scent of childhood, and on holidays young girls go out walking just as they always have, and there is something timeless in the way they wind their scarves. Memory lives in the ocean, in galloping blood, in black burnt stones, in poems, and in every quiet conversation. The world is the same as it always was, full of shadows and anticipation. He would have gone on talking, but the crowd was growing larger, and the waves of mute rage spread until at last the envoys rose lightly into the air, whence, growing distant, they gently repeated, Peace be unto you, peace to the living, the dead, the unborn. The third angel alone said nothing, for that was the angel of long silence. Maybe now there's uh, 
Uh, this is a poem on swimming. Uh, I'm not an athlete, but I love to swim. And I don't swim very well, but I love doing this. Uh, but not in your leg. Uh, <laughs> do, do you swim in it in, in the summer? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do with the eyes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, on swimming. <clears throat> The rivers of this country are sweet as a troubadour's song. The heavy sun wanders westward on yellow circus wagons. Little village churches hold a fabric of silence so fine and old that even a breath could tear it. I love to swim in the sea which keeps talking to itself in the monotony of a vagabond who no longer recalls exactly how long he has been on the road. Swimming is like prayer. Palms join and part, join and part, almost without end. I think I still have a few minutes, right? You don't look like you were totally bored. <laughs> uh, so this is, this is a poem I wrote in Paris when I lived in, in Paris. Uh, I lived in a suburb where there was a forest, kind of a Parisian forest, which is not, you know, uh, not very wild, but still. In May. As I walked at dawn in the forest in May, I kept asking where you are, souls of the dead. Where are you, the young ones who are missing? Where are you, the completely transformed? Great stillness reigned in the forest and I heard the green leaves dream. I heard the dream of the bark from which boats, ships, and sails will arise. Then, slowly, birds joined in, goldfinches, thrushes, blackbirds, on the balconies of branches. Each of them spoke differently in his own voice, not asking for anything with no bitterness or regret. And I realized you are in singing, unseizable as music, indifferent as musical notes, distant from us as we are from ourselves. I didn't. Well, this is a poem I wrote, I think, in Berlin. It's called My Masters. It, it's a short poem. My Masters. <laughs> My Masters are not infallible. They are neither Goethe, who had a sleepless night, only when distant volcanoes moaned, nor Horace, who wrote in the language of gods and altar boys. My masters seek my advice in fleecy overcoats, hurriedly slipped on over the dreams at dawn, when the cool wind interrogates the birds. My masters talk in whispers. I can hear their broken speech. <clears throat> and I, I consider Osip Manderstam one of my masters. Uh, where is this poem for?
you know, because they say that Poles hate Russians, but not Mandelstam, certainly. Where is this poem? You know, this I think Putin cut out this page. <laughs> <laughs> I found it. <coughs> um, it's called in the. This is really true. When I was um, young and I had this big interest in Mandelstam, his name was in no encyclopedia. He was just erased, from, even in Poland. So actually we had, paradoxically, there were, we had some books of his of translation, mm -hmm. but in, not in, his name was absent from lexicons. So, <coughs> so I wrote this poem. In the encyclopedias, uh, no room for Osip Mandelstam. In the encyclopedias, once again, no room for Osip Mandelstam. Again, he's homeless. Still, it's so difficult to find a flat. How to register in Moscow? It's nearly impossible. The Caucasus still calls him. Asia's lowland forest roars. These days haven't arrived yet. Someone else picks up pebbles on the Black Sea beaches. This shifting investigation goes on, though the uniform is of a new cut and its wooden-headed tailor almost fell over bow bowing. You close a book, it sounds like a gunshot. White dust from the paper tickles your nose. A Latin evening is here, it snows. Nobody will come tonight, it's bedtime. But if he knocks at your thin door, let him in. And the last poem. So it's hard to choose the last poem. Okay, so I will read another poem on my mother. This one is simply called About My Mother. I could never say anything about my mother. How she repeated, you'll regret it one day when I'm not around <laughs> anymore. And how I didn't believe in either I'm not or anymore. How I liked watching as she read bestsellers, always turning to the last chapter first. How in the kitchen, convinced it's not her proper place, she made Sunday coffee, or even worse, filet of cod. How, he how she studied the mirror while expecting guests, making the face that best kept her from seeing herself as she was. I take after her in this and other weaknesses. How she went on at length about things that weren't her strong suit. And how I stupidly teased her, for example, when she compared herself to Beethoven going deaf. And I said cruelly, but you know, he had talent. <laughs> and, how, and how she forgave it all, and how I remember that and how I flew from Houston to her funeral and couldn't say anything and still can't. Thank you. So now, if there are any questions or...
complications, yeah. Could you say more about the process of translating? Because I think you're in an interesting position because you do speak English and translating your poems into English, you seem to have a good relationship with your translator and with something with that deals so closely with language where alliteration or rhythm might not carry over, how do you navigate that? Well, you know, uh, I don't know much about because this is her job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I must confess that I, you know, I, I, I could translate poetry into Polish, right? From English, from German, and from French because these are languages I know well. And I don't do it because I, I don't like to, I, it's really almost shameful for me to say it, but I can't translate. I, I don't get enough energy from translation. For me, the, when I write my own poem, my, my friends translated, translators hate it when I say this. But for me, the act of writing is this incredible act of, act of you have something inside you that's formless and energetic and you translate it into language which is very difficult but if it succeeds it gives you an enormous gratification and for me translating from one language into another it just doesn't give me this you know I'm spoiled I must be spoiled but I need gratifications and I, and so I I tried many times to do translations from, from the German or from the English and I never finished a translation because I, I, I'm not motivated enough. So I, don't, I know actually very little about the mechanics of it. I'm really sorry, I, I, it's not, I'm not trying to, you know, to, to make you sad now, but, <laughs> but I don't know how my Claire, she, she seems to, she's a wonderful translator. But you know, she herself, she doesn't like talking about translation. She, she says that translation is an action. It's, and now there's a very fashionable the theory of translation. She hates the theory. She says, I don't need a theory, I just go and do my translation. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I think this is, translation is one of the things that are fulfilled in the action of doing it. And, and the, there's a huge building of theory. Uh, it's of course n needed in the academy, but it's not, it's not something that would help the translator. <laughs> so, so I don't, and you know, I, I wrote maybe two or three poems in English, but then it's not, trans it's, it's writing. It's, I said, then I, d I don't translate a pre-existing text uh, in Polish, in, into English. No, I, I just write in English. So sorry. No, that answers my question. Yes. Um, a group of us were meeting, reading your poem, and several times the question came up about your fascination or love of birds. And I don't know, we decided that we would ask you about that. Uh huh. I don't know what to say, I just, you know, the, you, one of the problems for me with America is that you, you don't have our blackbirds, you have different blackbirds, right? you have the American blackbird. If you're in any European city between February and June, the cities are filled with the song of blackbirds. I, actually, they, they migrated from the forest, they lived in the forest up to the end of the 19th century. And then they decided it's better for us and safer to be in the city. <laughs> and they moved to the cities. And they're wonderful singers. And I, I don't know how it happened. I just, because I know from conversations that 95% of people living in, in the European city don't hear the song. That's an incredible fact. You know, people don't listen to birds. They, oh, this is like the background, it's like, you know. And since I discovered this song when I was pretty young, I, 
I fell in love with this song. And for me, singing birds are, are just, you know, they're like my friends, poets, are poets. Uh, we sing, we try to sing. So. I, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't write uniquely about birds. It's not so that birds are my unique preoccupation. No, but I, indeed, I, I love the song. And I'm very happy that they're doing well. They're not, you know, like blackbirds. So they have no problems, there's no danger to, to the existence of, uh, of, of blackbirds. So. Yeah, there's someone, but yeah. Your famous poem about raising the mutilated world that occurred in New Yorker in yeah. after 9-11. Do you remember the day you wrote that? Is there a story there? Yes, I, I don't remember the date. I, I remember it was maybe an hour and a half before 9-11, because this poem was written much before. And I, I remember I was on a train, I don't know where. And then I didn't write the poem, and the, only this line come, came to my mind, try to praise the mutilated world. <clears throat> and then I just, when it came to my mind, I, I had my, my little notebook, of course, you know, so I wrote it down. And I knew that it sort of defines what I do, because this is what I do, I, tr I praise the mutilated, because I was born in a country that was totally devastated. When I was young, it was still devastated, this slowly being rebuilt, and, and, and human lives were devastated. And so I, this is the, the paradox of my early life, to, when I started to write, uh, Although I, you know, it's complicated, I, but generally speaking, I, I think the poets can be divided into rebels and praisers. And I am rather a praiser. Although uh, when I was young, I, I had a long moment of a political, uh, you, you know, I wrote political poems that were not praising at all. <laughs> they were very critical of the government, of the communist system. But then I understood it's not my main thing. It, I was, it was uh, that my main thing is rather to praise than to, to rebel. But then I understood I'm praising the mutilated world. I'm praising something, in, something doubtful. It's something that's not totally perfect, but rather very imperfect. So I wrote down this this one line and. Sometime later, leafing through my notebook, I, I, I discovered it again, and, I, and then I sat down, and, and the rest of the poem came. That's the whole story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes? I was also in the reading group on Unseen Hand, um, your book, Unseen yeah. Hand. And one of the things that, uh, one of, you kept referring to the Garonne River. And Which river? Garonne? Garonne, yes. And it kept coming back. Yes. Yeah. Poems, the lovely Garonne. And, mm -hmm. and I just was curious, what is it about the Garonne River? Is, is there something special about it? Well, yes, but I've, I discovered it in a, one of the most beautiful poems by Helderlin. He has this poem, Remembrance, which is really it's one of the most pe beautiful poems in the entire world for me. Uh, and it's Garon plays a role in this poem. You, you know that Herderlin spent some time in Bordeaux. He walked through the entire France because he was so poor. He couldn't afford any better transportation. And the TGV didn't exist either. So. And he, uh, and when then he walked back to Germany, he 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 made his living as a, a private teacher, as a tutor, for rich families, which was not a very pleasant occupation because most of these young teachers were treated like servants, and and he was a genius, you know. So you had a genius who was treated like a servant, and. and and then he returned prematurely to Germany. No one knows why, there's this mystery, why he left Bordeaux. And he walked back to Germany and he was mad. It was the beginning of his madness. 
as you, you may remember, the, he spent the 30 last years of his life in madness. But before he became really mad, he wrote uh, the, his most beautiful poems. So this short period of writing after he came back to Germany from France. And this one poem, Remembrance, is for me one of my beloved poems. And then, a few years ago, I went uh, to Toulouse, and I saw Garonne. And Garonne is a beautiful, you know, all rivers are or almost all. Not the river in the Silesian city where I grew up, because it's black. It's, it's, the industry killed it so completely. But the Garonne is one of these beautiful rivers. And suddenly seeing this river, it had created like an arch between the Hölderlin's poem and, and the actual river. And Toulouse is a beautiful city, it's a pink city, you know, it has the pink walls, it's very beautiful. So, so it, this is how, how it came to be. Yes? I, uh, Adam, I was going to ask you about the effect on you and your content of your poems as well as the tone. You've shared with us so generously you were driven out of your original home in Ukraine. You didn't really find a home in Silesia. Um, growing up in Krakow, Paris, and obviously in the United States. I was going to ask, but you've already told us quite a lot, so let me ask, what part of your love or your travel or your study that brought you in such intimate contact with the Greeks, the uh, Parmenides, and the other folks like that? Uh, I just lost the name. Uh. Well, I wouldn't overdo my the depths of my <laughs> my knowledge of the Greek. Yeah, Heraclitus and Parmenides. Heraclitus and Parmenides. You know, I studied philosophy as a young man, so we spent some time on pre-Socratic philosophers. And I always loved pre-Socratic -pre philosophers. Uh, without the, the Nietzschean ideological thing, you know, that the, actually philosophy ends after them. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, no, I don't, you know, I know I'm in a place where many people study Greek. I never studied Greek. Um, the, the only consolation, you know, I, I read some of the Goethe didn't know Greek, so if Goethe didn't know Greek, I, <laughs> I, I, I can live with it. But, uh, uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm not a great connoisseur of Greek philosophy, but, you know, also I think, you know, I, I have many friends, poets, and some older poets who died, and I, I know that poets uh, pretend that they know. They, they don't read books like scholars. I don't, I don't think that a poet ever has finished reading a book. You know. <laughs> <laughs> poets are looking for some things that would inspire them. They're not reading for scholarship, no. no. Now they, they read maybe 10 pages, but they have this serendipity, and they, maybe they find this the ten most important pages in a book. Uh, so I am the same, you know, I, I couldn't pass an exam on, on pre-Socratics, but, but, but I love, you know, I love this short, this aphorism, these the unfinished sentences, it's so beautiful, you know. And it's poetry, it's actually pure poetry, what, what they did. I, I, quite recently I, <coughs> I wrote another, poem which is not yet translated, and the title is Poets are Pre-Socratic, so it's a kind of equation between poets and pre-Socratic. Yes? Uh, I mean, at this stage in your writing life, are you, what are you, are you still working on like developing yourself as a poet, or can you pretty much just say, oh, you, this is what I want to write, and it comes down to maybe you keep working on it, or are you, do you have goals in mind of how you want to evolve yourself still? Uh-huh. It's a very interesting question. You know, I'm not young. I, you may think I'm very young, but I'm... Uh, it's a problem, yeah, it is a problem. And 
you don't know, but I think there's no way you can influence, there's no way I can say, oh, I decide now I will be turning to the left, or I will be turning to the right. It happens, there's something, some process in you of a growth which could stop one day, you know, it stops when we die, apparently. It, with some people it stops much earlier. <laughs> but, but, uh, so, I hope, you know, um, I've published my most recent book in Polish in October last year. Then I went to hospital, I had a heart surgery. It went very well, so don't, don't have compassion for me. I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing very well. But since, I haven't written a single poem. It doesn't worry me, because it happens. Especially after you publish a book, a collection of poems, it always is followed by, by s several months of silence. Because publication of a book is a caesura. It, it just you have to do something in innerly. <clears throat> so I don't worry. But there's no way you can influ influence this. You, you just have to be honest, you know, to read, to think, to give yourself time for not to accept all the invitations you get because it can kill your, your time. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a danger if you have this so-called success as a writer, it's meant to kill your writing, because then you just travel from one place to another, uh, and you have no time, and it's not a matter of time, of concentration, of this deep calm which is needed for, for writing. So your question is my question. I, I ask myself the same question, what comes next? And I hope it, it will come, something will come, but, this, you know, I cannot push it. There's no, nothing I can do. Yeah, Jessica. Sorry, keep throwing more questions at you. But I, I have one. In our, in our book circle, um, the first poem we read was the very famous poem, To Go To Love. And um, we began debating amongst ourselves whether or not the poem was, in the end, suggesting it was or was not possible to go to love. And so I said we should ask you when you come. Um, but uh, in all seriousness, the poem really plays with the paradox of you know, to go to love, and there's an imperative go. At the end, it says go there, you know, it's everywhere. And that thematic of a kind of submerged city comes up in a number of poems. Mm -hmm. um, and why is childhood, you know, our only longing, this kind of sense of a, an ideal that's also in the past. And so I guess my question is, um, to, in what way is it possible? Like, in, does the poem suggest that it is possible to return to that city? You see what I'm saying? Like, in what way is it possible and not possible at the same time? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Right. It's, it's a beautiful question. I, I wrote this poem many years ago. I wrote it in Paris, I know exactly where I wrote it, in Paris, after, or two months after I came to Paris. And actually, I came to Paris not for political reasons, but to join my future wife. So it was an you know, erotic travel to, to Paris. Um, and it, yeah, it is for me one of the most important poems. I rarely read it in public because it's too strong for me. It's like a huge emotion. I, I don't know. It was just an explosion of, you, you know, when I, when I was very young and when I was a child and my, especially my grandparents will tell me stories about Lvov or this beautiful, like th this is the most beautiful city of the, in Europe. One day we'll return because they, they thought we would return there, of course. I was an illusion, and, mm, and I was totally indifferent to this. I was a child, I had my childhood, you know, I had my place, my, uh, the, later my books, my Jules Verne, and, you know, and James Fenimore Cooper, this was my world, and not, not the city. But later on, all these 
stories, in a way, sung in me. And later on, I understood they built the city in me. It was a, they were giving me the stories. That also, they're giving me their nostalgia, the terrible nostalgia. But, you know, it's only later I understood what a tragedy it was for them to lose their beloved city. They lived there for generations. They, they knew every corner, you know. They, they went to school, they went to university. It was their universe. And the, then one day, fun, go away, right? So you, you lose everything you have. And as a child, you cannot understand. You're too stupid, you know. You just don't understand this thing. And later on, it dawned on me, what it, the only solace they had, that it happened after the unimaginable terror of the Nazi occupation. Unimaginable. Like, they survived, but they, they saw corpses, they, they knew about, you know, like the Holocaust part in, in Lvov was as terrible as in other cities. And my mother would tell me she saw trucks with corpses, you know. Uh, and, and so after this, the shock of losing a city is a little bit milder, because after all, right, they survived this most horrible war. And in, in my poem, what I, 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 I try to reconstruct the city. It's for, for me, it's a reconstruction of the city. Uh, although, again, it came as an... Um, it was a little bit prompted by Yeats sailing to Byzantium. I just discovered Yeats then. There's no connection, but, the, the, but I endlessly ad admired Yeats's poem, Sailing to Byzantium. And this idea of travel, of sailing to a place, of going to a place, I think comes from Yeats. Uh, it, it's not a, you know, a, a, a very, or, going is everywhere, but, but still, this poem helped me to, this energy of Yeats's poem. And, and then suddenly, I did, writing this poem, I wrote it in three days, like, like one day after another. And while writing it, it I, I suddenly discovered I know so much about this city, though it's not a kind of formal knowledge, but I, uh, so it was a recreation of the city. And it, this ending that the love is everywhere, it's just kind of, oof, it's, it, it is there, it, oof, I, I've built it for, on two pages. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.